Welcome back. We're going to pick up on chapter two. Chapter two. His mother called, Palmer, hurry, they're coming. The doorbell rang. Palmer! He flew down the stairs. His mother waved him on. Go on, it's your birthday. You invited them. At the door, he turned, suddenly afraid to open it. He did not want to be disappointed. Are you sure it's them? His mother's eyes rolled. No, it's my Aunt Millie. Open it. He opened the door, and there they were. Beans, Meadow, Henry. Three grinning faces, shoving wrapped gifts into his chest, storming past him into his house with Beans bellowing. Where's the grub? Palmer stayed in the doorway, fighting back tears. They were tears of relief and joy. He had been sure they would not come, but they did. He wondered if they would give him a nickname. What would it possibly be? But that was asking too much. This was plenty. They were here with presents. They liked him. He was one of them at last. Arms full of gifts, he pushed the door shut with his foot and joined them in the dining room. Beans was scooping chocolate icing from the birthday cake onto his finger. With the drama of a sword swallower, he threw back his head and sank his finger into his mouth. When it came out, it was clean. Meadow cackled and did likewise. Henry stared at Palmer's mother, who was glaring at Beans. Palmer's mother did not like Beans. She wasn't crazy about Meadow or Henry either, but she especially did not like Beans. He's a sneak and a troublemaker, she had said. He's got a mean streak. She was right. But he was also leader of all the kids on the street, at least the ones under 10. It had always been that way. Beans was boss as surely and naturally as any king who ever sat upon a throne. But he's the boss, Palmer would explain to his mother. Boss my foot, she would snort and turn away. Some things mothers just did not understand. Over the presents, Beans barked. He rapped on the table with a spoon, and Meadow rapped a spoon also. Palmer dumped the gifts onto the table and for the first time took a good look at them. They were wrapped in newspaper, sloppily fitted and closed with black tape. No ribbons, no bows, and no bright paper. He tore open the first. It was an apple core, brown and rotty. It's from me, piped Mudo. Do you like it, Mudo howled. Palmer giggled. It's great, thanks. What a guy, that Mudo. The other gifts were a crusty, holy, once white sock from Henry, and from Beans, a thumb-sized brown, something that Palmer finally recognized as an ancient cigar butt. Silverware hopped as Beans and Mudo pounded the dining room table laughing. Palmer's mother, still glaring, came with more gifts. These had ribbons and bows and beautiful paper. Gee, she said, after all these nice presents you just got, I feel really cheesy giving you this junk. Palmer opened them, soccer ball, a book, a pair of sneakers, a Monopoly game. Thanks, Mom, he said. It was pointless to say more, pointless to say. I like their presents just as much as yours because they did it themselves. That means something. It means we came into your house. We gave you a cigar butt. You're one of us. Palmer's mother lit the candles, nine of them on the chocolate cake with chocolate icing. She started off the happy birthday song, but soon was drowned out by the boys who screamed it rather than sang. And when they came to the line, happy birthday, dear, they glanced at each other and belted out, Snot, happy birthday to you. So they'd done it. They had given him a nickname, Snots. He moved his tongue silently over the name, feeling its shape. For a moment, he wondered if he would be getting the treatment. But he pushed that thought aside. He was getting greedy. He'd already been blessed enough for one day. Make a wish, said his mother, and blow out the candles. He stared into the ring of candles Nine yellow flames, plump and liquid-like, perched on their wicks, and suddenly he felt the old fear launching itself from his shoulder 
and brushing a wingtip across his cheek. And just as suddenly it was gone and Beans was croaking. Hey, we ain't got all day. I got lots of wishes if you don't. Beans leaned across the table, took a deep breath and blasted away. The flames vanished. Wick tips glowed orange for a second and then turned black. Let Beans blow away. Palmer didn't care. Nothing could blow out the candle glow he felt outside. Palmer LaRue, snots. The world's newest nine-year-old was one of the guys. Chapter three. It was never meant to be a real party. Just cake and ice cream, Palmer's mother had said. That's all. She did not want those little hoodlums, as she called them, in her house any longer than necessary. The boys dragged out the cake and ice cream as long as they could. Beans and Meadow kept leaving their chairs and wandering around and flopping on furniture. And Palmer's mother kept shooing them back to the table. I guess you're done now, she said anxious to shoo them out the door. More ice cream, they said. And then Bean started having to go to the bathroom, or so he said. He made three trips upstairs, probably spying on Palmer's room. As he headed up the stairs for his fourth trip, Palmer's mother grabbed his arm and said, party's over, go out and enjoy the summer sunshine. As the guys left, Henry surprised Palmer's mother by saying, thank you for the party. Yeah, Palmer called back. Thanks, Mom. Palmer brought out his new black and white soccer ball. Bean snatched it from him and booted it into the back of Meadow's head. Meadow squawked, and the two of them rumbled onto the sidewalk. Beans and Meadow rumbled several times every day, and each rumble lasted about 20 seconds, with both claiming victory. The ball bounced down the street and into a neighbor's front yard. The front yards along Palmer Street were very small, about the size of a blanket. The grass was neatly trimmed and almost every house had a border of flowers. Most of the houses were gray. Henry chased down the ball and kicked it back up the street. Henry always looked funny running, all arms and legs. He was by far, by far the tallest of the group. And then Bean said, which one is Fish Face's house? Palmer didn't want to say. But Beans was looking straight at him. I'm not sure, he answered. Not sure, Beans gave a smirk. I guess I gotta start yelling then. And he cupped his hands and yelled, Fish face! Fish face! Fish face! Palmer quickly pointed to the house directly across the street from his. That's the one. Beans stepped up to the house and shouted, Fish face! Palmer cringed. No one came to the door, and no window curtain stirred. Okay, fish face, you asked for it. Beans turned to Meadow and Henry. Let's leave her a little present. They searched the gutter. Sewer grate, piped Meadow. The three of them raced to the nearest grate. Fish face was Beans' name for Dorothy Gruzik. Beans and the guys hated Dorothy, and they harassed her whenever they got the chance. Palmer had never understood why, though now that he was one of them, maybe he would find out. Maybe now he could finally find a fish in her face. Palmer's mother had been trying to push Dorothy and him together as friends for years. Palmer had never been much interested. For one thing, Dorothy was a girl. Plus, she was in a lower grade and a whole year younger than he. The guys returned from the sewer grate with something in a plastic bag. Just mud and sticks, said Beans glumly. He went to Dorothy Gruzik's house and dumped it on the top step. His face brightened. Maybe they'll think it's poop. He rang the bell, banged on the door, and everyone took off. It was the first time Palmer had ever run with the gang. He felt shivers of excitement. He screamed and beat them all to the corner. Chapter 4 they kicked the ball around for a while, then Bean said, let's go to the park. He booted the ball down the middle of the street. Why don't we play here, said Palmer, but the others were already dashing after the ball. Let's go to the park. Palmer hated the park. He never played there, never swung on the swings, never slid down the sliding board, 
never fed the ducks, and never watched a softball game. Most especially, he never went near the soccer field. For in one month, four short weeks after his birthday, the soccer field would become, as it did, every year a place of horror. I'm going to stop here. I want you to think about why it is Palmer would not like the soccer field. Palmer walked four blocks and he was at the park. He hoped they would be at the softball field, but he knew that they would not. Nor were they at the baseball field or the basketball court or the tennis court or the World War Cannon or the playground or the Boy Scout cabin or the picnic area. He heard and then saw them at the soccer field, racing and yelping like puppies in a pasture. He stayed on the sidelines, walked along the chalked edge of the fields. Come on, snots, they yelled, and they kicked the ball his way. Can't, my leg hurts. To prove it, he threw the ball back. I'll just stay here and watch. He hoped they wouldn't be mad at him for not joining in. He loved to see them playing with his birthday present. Each thud of a foot said, we're kicking your soccer ball. We like you. You're one of us. He wished it could stay like this forever, but it changed. Beans backed up and pointed at Henry and yelled, there's one. Henry began flapping his arms and swooping in circles, being a bird. Beans and Meadows made their arms like shotguns and pulled the triggers. Pow, pow. Henry veered, lurched, tilted, staggered to Palmer. Tall, gangly Henry did not look like a bird at all, but a giraffe with two howling hyenas snapping at its knees. It had long seemed a curious condition to Palmer that among the three kids rollicking on the field, Henry was the tallest, but also the meekest. Palmer had the sense that he was seen more than just a game, that Henry was not just a member of the group, but also its prey. After a minute or two of lopsided, long-legged careening, Henry flopped to the ground. Ringer! Ringer! shouted Beans. Ringer! shouted Mudo. And four hands clamped around Henry's neck, shaking Henry's head like a rag doll, twisting it this way and that. Ringer! Ringer! Henry's legs flailing, shrieking laughter. Ringer! Palmer tried to hold the moment there, but it would not stay. It tunneled back through time and burst up onto the same field three years ago, the first Saturday in August, when the grass was streaked with red and guns were booming and birds were falling. From the treetops, from the clouds, they plunged to earth, thumped to the ground, sometimes with a bounce. And still, some of them lived, flopping drunkenly across the grass, until a ringer grabbed one by the neck and twisted, and that was that. Beans and Meadow were now at each other's throats, rolling, rumbling, rollicking across the grass. Henry, woozy but up now, laughing with the others, then heading off with the others, the three of them yelping and kicking the ball up through the picnic area. Palmer did not know why he stood there, alone at the edge of the field, the last place on earth he wanted to be. As the voices of his new friends died away, he was aware of the silence. He looked up. Nothing flew in the sky. Nothing called from the trees. For a moment, a dragonfly hovered before his eyes like a tiny helicopter, then darted off. That was all. Silence and stillness. He ran. And I'm going to stop there and give you some time to think about it. And when we come back, we will pick up on chapter five. I miss you guys.